Okay, everyone. So uh, thanks for staying. Um, it is going to be a little bit different this year. Um, it's also a different remote, so we'll hope we get this right. Um, it is going to be a little bit different this year than, than it was last for a few reasons, but um, one thing is going to stay the same, and that, that is the thank yous. So let me start with Marae. Um, she's taken over um, following in some phenomenal footsteps for Paul, done a great job putting together this conference this year, um, bringing everyone together and, and retaining that feeling of, of family, both with the arguments and the agreements. Um, and um, in, in interest and innovation and excitement and even a little bit of depression yesterday, which we'll try to turn around a little bit today. But thank you for the efforts in, in putting this together and also in bringing together the young people who will be the next generation of family to take over when the rest of us finally do figure out we should retire a long time ago. Um, also to Paul, let me wish him all the best and many thanks for years of service not just to the school, but also to the conference and to making us all feel so welcome and setting the tone and culture for this great gathering. And then finally, of course, let me be the last speaker, but no less heartfelt. Thank you, Margaret, for all you do to take care of all of us, to set this up in every way. Now, at the risk of going a little off script and embarrassing two people in the audience, um, it is also unusual and a first time. I've been doing this conference for 20 or 21 years, not all in succession. So I'm spanning a generation. I mentioned last year that I have a son who actually has started um, first year law here at UC Irvine, who was the bell ringer at age eight out in the, in the, in the, uh, <laughs> in the lobby to get us all in here and very determined, like his mom, to get us all to do what we're supposed to do. So uh, that's Alex, and he is now first year law at UC Irvine, so another tie back to this great institution. Maybe now a second generation. I'm, I'm for the first time ever fortunate to have my husband and son, uh, my younger son, who is uh, 13 in seventh grade and really likes it here in California, but hasn't seen the rest of the world yet. So we'll see if there's another generation here. Um, this um, talk is, I had a feeling when I put this together that given all of the politics and all of the sturm und drang and heartfelt um, worries that many of us have about the direction of healthcare, never mind democracy in this country, um, that it would be appropriate to try to lift the spirits at the end of the conference a little bit and look forward to something. And it's not just because, but in part due to the fact that I am now part of Optum. See the orange, Optum? <laughs> this, this is branding, folks. Um, orange, Optum. <laughs> But I am now part of Optum, and there are great things happening, and that's part of the reason why I joined Optum and left Wall Street. So let's move on. So it was 30 years, um, and 30 years of saying, you know, the company reported blah, blah, or asking a question that no one really wanted to answer on a conference call. Um, that um, I saw an opportunity to move from being the movie critic that a Wall Street analyst ultimately is criticizing management teams for the movies that they never intended to make in the first place to actually becoming, finally, putting my, my money where my mouth is, um, an actor, producer, director, an active participant in bringing about healthcare transformation on many, many levels with an organization that is focused on it. Um, Optum is the healthcare services business of United Health Group, a publicly traded company. Um, what was... I probably should actually give you the, the disclaimer about I may be making forward-looking statements, and you can't hold United Health Group or Optum accountable for anything I say because it's all my opinion only and not theirs. Um, but the mission of Optum, <laughs> the mission of Optum, um, and that it shares with United Health Group is to um, help people live healthier lives and to help make the healthcare system better than every better for everyone, work better for everyone, and that's to me, what this position represents. In 2010, I was fortunate enough to be asked, in Memorial Care, you're somewhat responsible for this, I was asked, and some of you have heard this, to um, come out and address a group of business people, uh, 200 of them, for Memorial Care's business breakfast, right after the passage of the ACA. 
These were very, very worried business people. How, small business, how is it going to affect us? And for some reason, Memorial Care was kind enough to think that I might have some answers for them. And so we talked it through for about a half hour. After that meeting, I found out that, that United Health Group was trying to buy the largest capitated physician practices in Southern California. And I was asked what, if anything, Memorial Care could do about it. The answer was, of course, nothing. Stark laws, a bunch of other things, it made it very difficult. You know, there's a thing called a private plane. You can fly the doctors out if you're not a hospital system, but you can't even basically pay for their lunch if you're a hospital system. You're at a disadvantage, okay? So, so there were certain inequalities in that, in that bidding process or in that courting process. But what was really interesting to me was this was a fundamental change. United Health Group was an organization that didn't even know how to spell the word capitation, never mind embrace it. And here they were talking to a group of physicians, multiple groups of physicians, who specialized in taking risk and organizing in that way. Something was afoot. And that became an understanding of the answer to a very simple question. If you operated a large, at-scale business focused on growth in a completely broken marketplace, Cheryl, what would you do? And the answer is find a way, invest in the tools, the technology, the people, the solutions, the aggregation, the partnerships, all of those things necessary to fix the healthcare system over a long period of time. That's what you would do, fundamentally, absolutely, permanently fix our broken healthcare payment and delivery system. And that's what I learned about Optum. Those were my words, not theirs, before it even exists. And I'm proud to say that, that um, in January of this year, I finally went from being the movie critic to the actor and the producer and helping to achieve that vision. So let's talk about what happened in 2017, my last year, and whether there was anything that finally pushed me out the door and go on to the corporate side. And the answer in 2017, you know, when I was here last year, it was a little bit, you know, scary and worrisome and depressing and, and certainly know that the political and, and, and geopolitical environment hasn't changed that much. But what certainly was unexpected was this. So I think that, the, yeah, that, okay. 2017 was here. Back in here, we were really very, uh, excuse me, 2016, back in here, the election day, the stocks took a nosedive. And now in 2017, we went straight up from that early 20, uh, late 2016 collapse on the day after election day when at 3.30 in the morning I was downgrading all my stocks. And so here we were, yeah, well, I didn't sleep that night. Um, and then here we were at the end of the year going into 2018, and lo and behold, tax reform passes, and all of healthcare stocks, just like the rest of the market, soared. So let's talk, these are healthcare stocks in total. So this includes biotech, and it includes um, healthcare services, and it also includes pharma, all right? So now if we move on to the next one, which is just healthcare services, and this is the um, S&P Spider Index for, um, it's an ETF. You don't need to know what that is, but that's all right. Anyway, what it does is it tracks all of these stocks as a group. It's a basket. So they actually own these stocks in, underneath the fund. Okay, so here's some, some, you know, um, point, some points that I, I'd like you to consider. So the House surprisingly passed reform, okay? Um, and, and why was it a surprise? Well, I kind of figured, like everybody else did, that you know they find that the Republicans had been pretty good actually at sticking together as a party and and voting as a block. And lo and behold, when it comes to health care, everybody splinters. But middle of the night, they figure it out, whatever it was, they finally get it passed in the House. Um, in two thousand, in the twenty seventeen second quarter, health care services sector. Um, this is mostly driven by hospital stocks. Guess what? Commercial managed care volumes, which had been declining through all of the ACA expansion, finally started to collapse. And companies missed numbers. That was this. And then you come into the third quarter, okay? And in during the third quarter, <coughs> the Senate starts debating Increasingly interesting, see now I work for a corporate, corporate entity, I can't say what I really think, increasingly interesting 
um, reform suggestions from fat to skinny, from big and bulky to stripped down. And for a variety of reasons, one of which was this, um, it didn't get passed in the Senate, so it had to be abandoned and then done piecemeal later on. And that, interestingly enough, look what happens. I mean, the stocks go down here, then they go back up, and then here the Senate starts debating reform and it goes back down again, and then they can't get it done, and you have an earnings debacle in the third quarter as well. Why? Commercial managed care volumes are declining. Payer mix is shifting to government payers. What's the difference? Mm. Well, in some cases, for not acuity adjusted, managed care revenue per admission for a hospital could be double that of Medicare and maybe triple or quadruple that of Medicaid. So guess what? No money, head in bed, big loss. That's what happens. And then you get tax reform. Whether or not the healthcare companies were profitable, they all benefited from tax reform, or at least their stock prices did. So um, we still saw some you know, volumes remaining challenged for the rest of the year for hospitals. Um, there was some excitement that sort of got me motivated towards the end of August, beginning of September, which was that Tenet Healthcare had a new CEO and finally undergoing strategic review after its largest shareholder resigned from the board. And that's still an ongoing situation where they're looking to enhance shareholder value by um, engaging in some strategic alternative um, exploration. So, you know, Tenet, once upon a time, having been a big player out here in California, still a big player in California, uh, Southern California, going through some significant changes. Uh, we did see the Dignity CHI deal finally move to a um, definitive agreement. So, you know, I know there was some comment about M&A here. I don't know, from not-for-profit hospital land, we're certainly seeing a lot of those kinds of combinations, uh, Ascension St. Joe and, and a few others that are being contemplated out there. So lots of assets changing hands and lots of M&A going on there. Maybe not so much, in, you know, we're not seeing you know, the mega deals on the health plan side getting done, but we are seeing some vertical integration or some non-traditional horizontal integration being proposed. Um, and then, of course, for the not-for-profit world, the pain of the 340B reimbursement cuts, um, certainly something that they are dealing with that could have some significant ramifications for cash flows for those organizations. Um, for the health plans, um, so, you know, um, really a surprise, I think, that, that you know, um, <coughs> The, at least one of the four um, companies didn't get to merge with one of the other four companies, but it didn't happen. Um, and, and there are still some changes that are going on there. There was the announcement of CVS Aetna, for example, um, and there's still some you know, consideration of what could or should be done in that area. Um, there is a relief from the health insurance industry fee for 2019 as a, as a result of tax reform, a loss of the individual mandate. Um, but overall, earnings are remaining strong, cost trends remained well controlled, um, and we're still seeing a shift in, in utilization from inpatient to outpatient. It's, um, it's still a benefit um, for the publicly traded companies, at least, who have exited the exchanges from which they were not making money and still devoting more and more of their time and effort to um, Medicare Advantage growth. And so uh, the managed care companies have actually done pretty well. Um, looking at post-acute, which I think is going to become an in, in even more important um, segment for us to um, understand, think about, uh, re-engineer, transform, fix, you know, however you want to describe it, but that's certainly um, an area that I think is, is ripe for improvement. Um, CMS um, did throw us a curveball over the summer um, and um, announced something called HHGM, um, the home health grouper model. Um, Basically, what they were going to do is pull the rug out from under all of the Medicare home health agencies and moving them from a 60-day episode of care to a 30-day episode of care. We'd have to re-engineer their entire referral and care planning process. Not that that would necessarily be bad. It's just trying to implement that kind of change in 18 months in a very traditional healthcare services, Medicare fee-for-service industry ain't going to happen. I mean, it's hard enough to program the price changes when they, for the fiscal year that starts in January, when they don't come out until September 
to get them right from a CMS perspective and the home health agencies. So, you know, they get them done, but it's hard work. And that's what change is in healthcare. It's hard work. We can talk about this as being easy, but this is hard stuff. And the systems aren't necessarily the latest and greatest cloud technology. So sometimes it's hard to run things on systems that are barely, you know, a couple of steps up from big mainframe computers that, you know, my husband and I, you know, used to work on. So, uh, well, he did. I didn't. I called people like him. Skilled nursing facilities, um, they generally had a really tough year. I mean, the BPCI, CJR, it's working. And if the goal of the exercise was to shift the site of care, it is absolutely working. Whether it's voluntary or, man or mandatory, it's absolutely working. And skilled nursing is seeing changes in payer mix. They're seeing changes in acuity. They're seeing the easy money that was made from a 28-day length of stay for a post-surgical joint patient um, going away, even if it was only 14-day length of stay. Doesn't matter. It's now zero. Big problem. Now, some are prospering. How are they prospering? This is something we didn't hear a whole lot about over the last couple of days. We started to hear about it in the morning. We didn't hear about it too much over the last day or so. Quality, star ratings. So one of the things that, that some companies have had success in doing is buying facilities that have low star ratings and making them into facilities that have high star ratings. And that allows them to take advantage of some loopholes in the CJR that allow them to not have a three-day prior stay in the acute care hospital before being reimbursable under CJR in the post-acute setting. What does that mean? It means they have access to patients and can get paid for it that others who are poor quality do not. That's what that means. So there are, interestingly enough, even in the midst of all of this bad news for a sector, there are people who are smart enough to figure out that quality is a pathway to success. On the supply chain, the business model is undergoing transformation. Certainly, it's undergoing potential disruption. But it's in part undergoing the transformation due to the 2016's focus on drug costs. But the lack of political focus continuing over the 2017 year, and perhaps restarting in the 17 to 18 time frame, and an acceleration of the FDA's review process under new leadership sparked a very steep rally in biotech. So they went from, we can't touch them, to we've got to go out and own every single biotech stock that we could for those who can invest in equity and high-risk securities. Now, the next question, of course, is, is Amazon going to be the party pooper? Are they going to spoil the 2017 party in 2018 for the PBMs, for the medical supply companies? Do they really understand what it means to say no when they're adjudicating a, a, a uh, pharmacy claim as a PBM, is that the business they want to be in? Um, and, and of course, as was mentioned on the earlier panel, there is this notion that healthcare is complicated. Who knew it was so hard? <laughs> um, healthcare is complicated, and that people, people's lives are at stake, and that maybe a standard of care needs to be taken before we go off and innovate. Okay, without regard to whether or on the consumer side, without regard to perhaps what ramifications it has on the back end. When you run an integrated front end to back end solution, maybe you've got an answer. Um, so, one of the things that you get used to in 30 years of being a Wall Street analyst is uncertainty. You don't like it, but you get used to it. And it remains a, content, a, a constant. So when I did this presentation, because I was trying to be timely in my response to Margaret, chip funding wasn't 100% sewed up there, so I left it as an open item. But obviously, that, that has, with relief, been done. Um, Medicare's approach to um, bundling and alternative payment models is interesting, because we went from a price administration view uh, that made us all very worried that it was only going to be voluntary and maybe they'd back away because bundling seems to work to lead to both better outcome, lower cost, and higher patient satisfaction, um, that maybe we would be backing away from some of these models. But then CMS came out with BPCI Advanced. So you know maybe the Innovation Center does have a role to play. And maybe there are new payment models that <coughs> Medicare original fee-for-service, traditional, whatever you want to call it, the original Medicare program really will, will or can once again become a thought leader in payment transformation. 
Um, of course, we talked about the mandate in CSRs to death yesterday, so I'm not going to take, um, take time to talk about it. Whether or not repeal comes back in whole or in part probably depends on a political solution that we, you know, outcome in the midterms that we don't know yet. Um, I am worried about this $1.5 trillion in Medicare and Medicaid uh, cuts to fund tax reform, which was part of the original budget resolution, and what form that might take and reflected in the Trump budget. Um, because I would hate for that to sort of sneak up on, on providers, payers, patients, and others um, without us sort of knowing about how that, that hammer is going to drop on our head. Um, and then, of course, sequestration was just recently taken care of, so we don't have to worry about an across-the-board 2% cut. Um, so we have these, these four states of change, the movement towards value-based pay, payment for Medicare and whether or not that continues, whether the private sector will be left on its own, to its own devices to carry that mantle forward, new models of provider ownership and what impact they're going to have on the system. Um, we have the Bezos, Buffett, and Diamond disruptors or dreamers question. Um, you know, I can tell you working for Optum, which has been from the inside of healthcare, very much the inside of healthcare, working on these issues and these questions and these problems to bring technology. We, you want AI? We got AI. You want natural language processing? We've got natural language processing. You want 190 million uh, claims records and 100 million clinical records layering on top of all of that. Um, the curated consumer d database, it already exists, folks. That's why I went to Optum. But making that connection, going that last mile, getting the power of that to the decision maker takes time. You can't move faster than the market, which was one of the comments that was made earlier. You can only move as fast as your last transaction. You can push the market. But certain things, we haven't been able to move people fast enough to keep up with the kind of pace of technology change they're willing to accept in the non-healthcare environment. So that's going to be a continuing state of change. But be there no question that this transformation is already happening in healthcare. Sites of care are changing. The way we're making care decisions are changing. The way we're aggregating and organizing care delivery systems is changing. What we're doing and where we're investing and how we're thinking about customer service and MPS scores and all of the rest of those things, already changing. So to some extent, that's a state of change that's already here. And whether it's being done through partnership or directly through Optum or it's being done in your oral organizations, give yourselves a little bit of credit. Every single one of you making a care decision using a different tool today or a different approach or a best practice is part of that process of change. So thank you. Keep going. Do more. <laughs> so broad things and the next great thing other than my brand new job and my orange suit. Um, <laughs> this, I want to just make this point here. This is, so this issue of cost shifting. Okay, now remember, I work for Optum. I don't work for United Healthcare, the insurance company. I work for Optum, the health services and technology enablement company, right? So that's important to understand because one of the things that health plans have been very successful in doing is figuring out a way through financial incentives to engage consumers in the cost of care. Because you have a high deductible, you now know how expensive healthcare is. Before you had a high deductible, folks, you didn't know, you didn't care because it was completely transparent. Now, things tend to go pendulum swing from one extreme to the other extreme. And there's a question about where we are here. But at the end of the day, what we learned was demand was not infinite for healthcare when price is not zero. We can self-ration. We can make wise choices, especially when we are informed about those choices and work with providers who are willing to accept new and better information and deliver it to us in a way that we can understand. All right? So how much more can my pocketbook, your pocketbook, anyone's pocketbook take in terms of funding our first three or four or five or six thousand dollars worth of care? What's the limit? And if we have reached a limit, how do we move to the next step 
to be able to reduce the total cost of care and therefore the total cost of our insurance in order to ease the cost burden, not just on our employers or the ultimate payer, be it ourselves or the government or the employer, but also the portion that will stay with us as, in t as our self-responsibility, self-insurance portion. And what we're finding is that it's not utilization that's driving cost trend. We've actually done a pretty good job, albeit in certain areas there's probably still way more we can do. But we've actually done a pretty good job of reducing or stabilizing utilization. What we've not done, and this is PWC data, by the way, um, is take care of the price. And we're still seeing medical prices, which is this red line here, start to tick up again. And that's what's driving a tick up in the projected cost trend for 2018 from 6% to 6 and half. And that's here. So after years of sort of you know, pretty reasonable declines, pretty steep declines as we focused on shifting costs to the consumer and reducing the total cost of care overall, getting down to the 6 and a half level, getting down to the 6 level, and now ticking back up to 6 and a half. Now that's a prediction, and that's PwC's prediction, but they've been pretty good. So we have to worry about this. So there's still work that needs to be done. Specialty pharmaceutical, behavioral change, putting more and better tools in the hands of decision makers, be they a consumer, a patient, I don't, I have to step back a second. That whole notion that Jeff put up there is very important, that, that we play different roles, okay? We are consumers, so, you know, we probably order from Amazon three or four times a day sometime over on the weekend and not at all during the week because we're too busy. Um, and then, you know, you make up for it on the weekend, but we play different roles. We're consumers, we're patients, we're employees, we're employers all at the same time. Maybe if women were running the world and we were multi so used to multitasking, we might have a better model for how consumer, consumers in healthcare think about their decisions or how we need to reach them or think about them because we need to think about folks as multitaskers. Mm -hmm. We're not one or the other. We're all of those things at once. And since women make the majority of decisions about where healthcare is actually take, takes place, maybe that's an interesting way we should be modeling the consumer. That's a thought. Be that as it may, my consumer behavior and my healthcare behavior are very different, but I'm not the model. But for those for whom that model works, it's still behavioral change. We still are talking about the hard work of having, leading people, browbeating them, paying them, cajoling them, incenting them, coddling them, being their parent as an employer, not being their parent as an employer. Pick a model. We need people to change behavior. We need the right incentives, the right mechanisms, the right inducements to get people to make better informed choices. That's going to be hard. It's going to take time. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Just a recognition that that is, at the moment, a gating factor that needs to be invested in and addressed in order for us to get this change. But these broad advances in AI and machine learning, natural language processing, are going to help us to drive that total cost of care down. Right care, right time, right place. But only if we as consumers, as patients, as, as providers, as patients, are willing to accept those tools and integrate them into the decisions that we make. For the most part, we are, because we like tech, and we like gee whiz, and we like, to, we like the fact that when you look at the data, it actually tells you that this is really powerful stuff and you can actually start um, improving the health status of our patients. Um, so fee for value was a year of fits and starts driven by politics and then we get the BPCI advance, breathe a sigh of relief that we actually likely to still move to the fee for value environment. Um, so I had to put this in here. How many economies, health economies does it take to change a light bulb? None but the health economy has to want to change. Why did I put this in here? Because one of the things that's been a gaining factor in fee for value or moving to more of a risk-based environment has been the willingness of the participants to give up margin. And if it isn't the margin, it's the mission. 
So I was very encouraged to hear uh, Anne say, at least here in California, that there's a real willingness on the part of hospitals and health systems to want to change. There just may not be the ability. But moving from not wanting to change at all, fee for service forever, to wanting to change is a big step. And now working with those systems to enable that change is the next step. I feel like we're back to two canoes. A few years back, we had this two canoe theory, you know, how do you change a health system when you're really profitable and fee for service, but you have to move to fee for value? It's like be, trying to balance with one foot in one canoe and one foot in the other canoe. I can't balance in a canoe, never mind two canoes. But the point is that I feel a little bit like we've stepped backwards into this, um, this discussion about fee for service, fee for value, should we move forward, should we not? Um, and, and, and sometimes it's a mission problem because what I sort of sense among some of the, the, the not-for-profit engagements that I've had, whether it's speaking engagement or a sit-down conversation, there's oftentimes this perception that the mission is to provide hospital services or hospital-based services as opposed to providing healthcare and being the, so the resource for healthcare in the community. And part of what I see is in our work at, um, with the health systems is helping to remind folks that the, to return to the core mission, it's not about market share and putting heads in beds. It's about being the resource for healthcare in your community that makes the community, community live healthier, happier lives. And that's a mission change or a return to original mission. And again, that change will be hard, but it still has to be done. Um, we are seeing a lot of success, and the more success we see, we're going to see more um, change to value-based payments. Risk readiness is an area that um, we talk about oftentimes in terms of the provider. And I'm going to mention here that maybe we should start our conversations with the payers. Because what we see in many of our markets is that the providers are, in fact, very willing to take risk. Whether they should or not is another story. But they're very willing to take risk. What we're not seeing is the willingness of the, of the payer, per se, to share that risk margin at all or reasonably with the provider community. And in order for our markets to take advantage of the appropriate incentives that being at financial, never mind clinical risk, because doctors are at plenty of clinical risk, that's why you have malpractice, but the financial risk, that's one of the things that I think will be interesting to see how we are able to persuade those health plans that now is the time to move the whole system forward, to lower the total cost of care and create a better, healthier, more sustainable healthcare system, some of that risk margin needs to be shared. And that's going to be up to those of us who participate in the industry, whether we're a provider engaged with a payer or we're a facilitator in that regard, getting health systems to understand that lowering the total cost of care and helping them to gain market share at the payer level as opposed to market share at the provider level um, maybe might be the right way to approach this. But the most important thing would be the outcome of getting patients to the right care at the right time, in the right place, for the right reason, at the right cost. And yes, I'm still on the 5R topic. Um, <laughs> What is interesting is that population health is hot again now that it's pretty clear that the administration isn't backing off that part of the ACA and it didn't go away. So all of these value-based payments and, and population health becomes a hot topic again. Um, and with the cost trend predicted to rise again in 2018, um, I think we're seeing a reacceleration in the willingness to do risk-based contracts and the willingness to take more risk. And that may extend to the payer community as well. But make no mistake, if you're going to take risk, you need deep capabilities around patient engagement, satisfaction, physician alignment, and just writing the contract well to take that risk. Um, with, some, with very strong system interoperability inside of and beyond the health systems walls and the health, um, health providers um, uh, network and, um, and continuum of care. 
So you need those deep capabilities. You don't necessarily have to, you know, we're not in the day, day and age of the big, you know, computer center, but we certainly need to make those connections. We need to put more decision-making tools in the hands of um, those uh, clinical decision makers at the, at the point of care. Um, let's talk a little bit about the two reasons for the forces driving um, consolidation um, in the industry. And I think you all have seen that part of my presentation before. There's two reasons why you see consolidation as a rule, in my opinion, again, speaking for myself, not necessarily optim, it's fear and it's greed. Okay, That's what drives it. The fear of not having a sustainable business model or competition Regulation is coming and you want to get a maximum valuation now would be a combination of fear and greed. All of those things play into why we see consolidation. But the risk you run when you have two systems consolidating for the wrong reasons is that it doesn't work. Okay, And how many times have we seen it not work? So there's a real risk here. Just because you create something big doesn't mean you have scale. You just mean you have multiple problems, you know, instead of having 100 problems, you now have 200 problems, okay? You don't have 150 problems. It doesn't work that way, all right? So you have to watch, watch out for this. So there's got to be cultural alignment. There has to be the ability to integrate systems, even down to HR programs. You know, just a perfect example, two airlines merge. Okay? You still have the East Coast flight attendants and the West Coast flight attendants. They still have separate benefit packages. When you're a customer walking down the aisle of that airline and your flight attendants are saying, well, they have better retirement than I do, that's a cultural failure. Okay? When you have an annoyed flight attendant, it's inconvenient. When you have an annoyed nurse, it could be deadly. That's the difference between airlines and healthcare. Benefits of tax reform. There's going to be significant investment in our industry this year, just in the public traded companies alone. And there's going to be significant cash flows. And those investments are going to be made in technology and in innovations and in moving our system out of where it is today into new ones. You'll see M&A, you'll see dividends, you'll see share buybacks, but you're going to see real investment. You're going to see real growth coming from those tax dollars. Um, and we're also going to see, as, as was mentioned before, you don't have to buy something or own it to be able to create something good and new. We're going to see a lot of interesting alignments, a lot of interesting partnerships. We're going to see a lot of potential, you know, you could see direct to provider contracting raise its head again. Um, you could see a lot of, um, change being um, driven by the desire to invest in new models of care, invest in new models of payment and delivery. 90 startups in healthcare IT, that's great. You know, that's like the, where, where's Robertson Stevens when you need it? It's like the old days, the good old days of, of what we saw after um, Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1987 that created healthcare services as we know it and post-acute care uh, funding for Medicare. This is going to be really, really interesting, but I will tell you, new technology comes out, and the challenge we run in healthcare is $3 trillion, you need something that can scale. It's going to have an impact, it's got to have scale. So I love all this technology. It is a really exciting time to be part of healthcare when we're finally seeing the promise, not just of the internet, but real tech and real development and real use of all that information that we have about our patients and our customers and how we can serve them better. Um, so before I get to my call to action for providers, which actually I, I did a good job. I'm not going to be too late today. Um, there are a couple of things that I did want to mention because I wouldn't be me if I didn't, OK? <laughs> um, so. Um, There was a slide up here that showed population cohorts by age. 
And you've heard an awful lot, you know, so like you had the baby boomers and then you had the millennials and you know, poor Generation X gets lost in the shuffle and then you had whatever it is we're calling the kids of millennials, okay? So I'm a baby boomer naturally, right? My generation, you, you all should be really afraid of what happens as my generation ages because we've transformed everything. Schools, housing, job markets, everything, okay? But the one thing I haven't heard in this conversation this, the last two days is, what happens when the millennials age? They're bigger than we are, and they certainly will be by the time they get there because we're going to die. It's, it's just age, right? So this is a very big group, and that group is going to demand service in a way that we have been trained not to because when I was growing up, our parents said, no one's going to take care of you but yourself. So figure it out. And our kids and the millennials are thinking, everybody has to take care of me and give me instant gratification. We did that to them. <laughs> OK? They're going to want to pick up their phone, see a doctor, look at the commercials. They're great. 3 o'clock in the morning, the baby's got some sort of rash. The father can't see where he's going. He falls down. It's a United Healthcare commercial. It's a great commercial. Loved it. Laughed a million times. Point is, OK? Point is that that mom's getting instant information and, grat and gratification. So, you know, what's the timeline for the millennials hitting the age where they're going to need, where their bones and their joints are going to fall down and they're going to do the hard work of aging? How many years before that leading cohort goes in? That is the barrier before we all better get really smart on consumerism, right care, right place, right time, fixing our healthcare system because if my generation doesn't bankrupt our system, that generation surely will. So that's your warning shot in the prediction across the bow. And then finally, um, the other thing that I want to just sort of stress here is that with all of the providers in the community, one thing that we as transition agents and executives and doctors and clinicians and all the rest of that, but particularly those of us who aren't clinicians, should never lose sight of is the fact that doctors, nurses, anyone in healthcare want to deliver great care. And that's our biggest ace in the hole, that if we help physicians and nurses and other forms of clinicians to make better decisions for their patients and with their patients, then the part of the healthcare crisis that we face today will take care of itself. But we should never forget that they always want to provide great care. Okay, now, so that was the spirit, that was the uplifting spirit. My warning call for providers here, okay? And this is mostly to hospital system executives. This market share model, which believe me, I have loved and endorsed, buy it, fix it, grow it, do it again. That's market share model, heads in beds, put more heads in those beds. It's done. It may not feel like it, but it's done. Commercial managed care volumes are falling. Utilization is declining. Managed care is really smart about what you're doing. They're not going to let you do it. They can't. The system is demanding too much efficacy. And besides which, quality is not so good. Patients get sick in hospitals. OK? So the market share strategy of building more beds must change. It's being challenged because of starvation in the land of plenty, which is a thesis that I've had about the health system for, since 2006. Lots of old people, no money to pay for it. You figure it out. We are living in starvation in the land of plenty, and it's going to get worse. So please, you want to change? Figure out how to get to change. And change means moving to value-based care. It's moving to high-quality care. It's understanding that you're in the business of delivering health care, not filling hospital beds. And if you have a hospital bed and you can't fill it, you know what? You might not fill it with acute, but I will bet you there's a lot of need for psych. Next best use, OK? Medicare Advantage, really good at controlling this. Medicare Advantage understands why. Because of star scores, because quality matters. You put in star scores for commercial plans, guess what? The acceleration in the, in the reduced use of hospital-based care 
or poorer quality care or less efficient or effective care, wherever it takes place, will accelerate. And then finally, data, analytics, artificial intelligence, machine learning. So think about how much a health system makes on diabetes care. Right now, there's 30, 40 markers that physicians look at as an indicator that you're going to come down with diabetes. AI-enhanced systems can come up with 10 times that number of markers. Much more accurately predict who's going to get diabetes. Okay? Once we keep a diabetic out of the health system, how many beds are you all going to be able to fill? That's where we're going. And that's why I'm pleading with you all to understand the market share model is done. Figure out how to be the most effective health leader in your community by championing the best care in the right place, at the right time, for the right reason, and at the right price. If you do that with these new market constructs, and all of the rest of that, then I will bet your system will in fact be, be, and your physician practices will be ready for what I call the shining city on the hill, the future of healthcare, built on technology, analytics, and enabled by physician-led, patient-centered care, a place where well gets done. Thank you very much.